Good afternoon and welcome. My name is Alex Weiss, Director General here at the Institute of International and European Affairs, and you're all very welcome indeed this afternoon. Human impacts on the global ocean are increasing in scale and scope. And as we learn more about climate change, plastic pollution, deep sea mining and overfishing, we see ever more clearly that these impacts alter our relationship with the ocean. Around the world, people are working together to observe, understand and act to sustain ocean habitats. And this is the important and indeed urgent subject matter of this afternoon's webinar here at the IIEA. And I'm really delighted to introduce our speaker, our distinguished, distinguished speaker, joining us from California, where it's nice and early. Uh, Dr. Tessa Hill is professor at the Earth and Planetary Science, Sciences Department at UC Davis, and she's co-author of At Every Depth, Our Growing Knowledge of the Changing Oceans. As this is an online event, uh, you'll be able to join the discussion uh, using the Q&A function you're well familiar with. You can see it there on your screen. Feel free um, when, uh, in accordance with um, uh, your ability to do so, to send uh, your questions in as they occur to you. Uh, sorry, I got a bit distracted there. Um, if a question occurs to you while Tessa is speaking, send it in just as soon as it does. You don't have to wait till the end. And we'll have all the questions here. We'll be able to put them um, at the end. Um, please, if you wouldn't mind uh, mentioning your name and affiliation, if you send in a question, it's always a help. And we'll come to them, as I say, once the presentation is finished. Just a reminder that the presentation and the Q&A are both on the record. And you'll be able to join the discussion if uh, you're that way inclined on X using the handle at IIEA. And if you wouldn't mind, you might tag us in any post that you want to share uh, if you're in fact using social media. Dr. Tessa Hill is a professor in the Earth and Planetary Sciences Department and Associate Vice Provost for Public Scholarship and Engagement at UC Davis. She holds a PhD in Marine Science from UC uh, Santa Barbara. Um, her research interests include climate change, both past and present, and understanding the response of marine species to environmental perturbation. She's part of the Bodega Ocean Acidification Research Group at Bodega Marine Laboratory, um, which aims to understand the impacts of ocean acidification and to partner with uh, local community groups to address these impacts. Tessa is a fellow of the American Association uh, for the Advancement of Science and the California Academy of Sciences. And as I mentioned previously, she is co-author of um, the re recently published work entitled At Every Depth, Our Growing Knowledge of the Changing Oceans, um, which was published earlier this year. So over to you, um, Tessa, over to you, Dr. Hill, you're very welcome and the floor is yours. Thank you so much. Um, good afternoon to all of you. It, it is um, bright and early in the morning, my time, but I really appreciate you taking the time to be here today. Thank you for the wonderful introduction and to all of my hosts for inviting me to speak. Um, let me just pause for a moment here so I can share my slides. And um, Alex, maybe you could give me a thumbs up if that is like looking correct on the screen. Looks great. Great, okay. So today I'll be talking a little bit about how the ocean is changing due to human impacts and what we gain by seeing ourselves as connected to the ocean and maintaining that connection. Um, as Alex mentioned, my discussion today will center around a book that I've recently published with my co-author Eric Simmons. The book explores the ocean through multiple habitats, starting with nearshore environments that perhaps we know very well, and taking a walk into the open ocean, polar areas, and deeper ocean habitats that may seem further from our typical human experience. But at its heart, the book is just is, is about just that, our human experience of being connected to the ocean and how people are working together to understand the future of our watery planet. My plan today is that I'd like to tell you a short story from the book It'll take me about, oh, 10 or 12 minutes to tell you that story. And so you can just sit back and relax and think about the themes that emerge for you in that story. 
And then I'd like to tell you more broadly about the themes of the book. And I'd like to bring those themes of the book as close to home as I can for all of you by highlighting issues that, as I understand, are of critical importance to Ireland, Europe in general, and the North Atlantic region. So the way I'd like to start today is to ask you all to think about a time that you felt connected to the ocean. Perhaps the most recent time that you visited the coast or something that you read or listened to or watched that made you feel curious about and connected to the watery part of our planet. I'm gonna pause here so you can think about this for a minute. So I would love to ask all of you to share out loud, but in the interest of time, perhaps you'd be willing to share something about your connection to the ocean in the chat box. And um, if not in the chat box, maybe you'd be willing to share it in the Q&A at the end. So I encourage you to open up that chat box and tell us a little bit about what draws you to the ocean or helps you feel connected to it. And as you hold that connection in the forefront of your mind, I'd like to tell you a story from the book that is fundamentally about our powers of observation, the power of knowledge, and the power of that connection that we have. The story starts with and centers around, at least in part, this paper, this scientific paper. If you ask scientists around the world what papers open their eyes to the shifting landscape that we will face as a consequence of climate change, many people will point out this paper by Jim Berry, Chuck Baxter, Rafe Sagarin, and Sarah Gilman. It was published in 1995, but the origin of the paper begins much earlier than that. In 1931, a young man named Willis Hewitt arrived in Monterey, California to pursue his PhD. Inspired by some of the biological discoveries happening at that time, Hewitt decided upon a dissertation research topic. He wanted to study the arrangement of animals in the, in the tide pools in front of Monterey, which is on the central coast of California, south of San Francisco. In 1931, he drove a series of iron bolts into the granite that forms the tide pools. For three years, he worked along the transect that was identified by these bolts, and he counted and categorized everything that was living in those pools. He completed his work in 1935. He filed his dissertation and moved back to Texas to become a professor of biology. He couldn't have possibly known the message that he left for future generations, the value of what we now know as baseline data. To understand this story, my colleague Eric Simmons and I had the pleasure of meeting with Jim Barry, one of the authors of that paper that I mentioned, and we shuffled through those tide pools in our very own boots. This is Jim on the left. Jim told us that in the early 1990s, his colleague Chuck Baxter at Stanford University mentioned to him that there was a sense that he had that something about the tide pools just looked different. As though over time, a subtle shift had taken hold, a difference in colors or textures or content of the pools themselves. And he couldn't quite put his finger on what those differences were. The two of them pitched a project idea repeatedly to Stanford University undergraduates to investigate this with them. And year after year, no students were interested in this sort of vague um, search for the differences that were taking place in the tide pools until students Rafe Sagarin and Sarah Gilman came along. There was just one problem. No one could quite remember exactly where the original transect in the tide pools was. While Willis Hewitt had described the transect carefully in his work, a clear line to sketch out the exact path of his study site wasn't included in his thesis. 
something that makes university professors groan. Uh, so Sagarin Gilman, Baxter and Barry plunged into the tide pool to look for Hewitt's bolts. Barry told us that he remembers being out at low tide in the middle of the night, lanterns casting the granite in sharp relief, pushing piles of seaweed aside to sweep the exposed rock with metal detectors. They did find those bolts eventually. They're pictured here on the right. And during the low tides of that year, the two students, Gilman and Sagarin, would lay down a one meter square box at each bolt and count and identify everything inside the box. By the end of the spring, they had documented 58,000 individual animals. The next step was to compare what they had counted in terms of the species and positioning to what Hewitt had described from 60 years earlier. In their 1995 article, Barry, Baxter, Gilman, and Sagarin reported that the abundance of eight warm water southern associated species had increased at the site, while five cold water species decreased since 1935. I'm showing you some of those warm water associated species here. The shift in assemblages coincided with measurements of water temperature indicating warming over several decades due to climate change. The lesson of the story was built upon some of the smallest inhabitants of the tide pools and yet carried a big headline. Scientists, especially those observing the ocean, did not have to wait to document the impacts of climate change. The ocean species were already on the move. Other scientists had begun to grapple with the implications of global warming around the world. You may be familiar with studies that documented shifting assemblages of trees, changing locations of native plant species, or the movement of bird and butterfly species. Those types of studies were being conducted on land at the same time. But because the tide pool resurvey in some sense connected our present to our past, it landed with particular heft. While the tide pool surveys were being discovered and rediscovered, there was another kind of discovery happening at the same time in the same place. Allow me to introduce you to Linda Yamane, an indigenous tribe member in California. Linda is a member of the Rumson Ohlone tribe from the central California coast, the area including and around Monterey. In the late 1980s and early 1990s, Linda went looking for an archive of notes about the Ohlone language, songs, and traditions. Her grandmother had told her stories, but she generally felt that she didn't know very much about her Ohlone culture. As she grew older, her curiosity about her own history increased. In 1985, someone mentioned to her that a local university library held an archive of mostly unexamined Ohlone information. It was a treasure trove of information stored away there by an Ohlone woman named Isabel Meadows, pictured here, who was working with ethnographer John Harrington. Isabel Meadows, the last fluent speaker of the Rumson language, worked with Harrington towards the end of her life to document language, stories, songs, and traditions of her people. Meadows died in 1939. Her last years of presence around the Monterey area would have coincided with Hewitt's time in the tide pools. It was surprisingly difficult for Yamane just to get an appointment to see the archives in the library. Librarians gave her conflicting information about where it was and how to access it, but she eventually gained access to the Meadows and Harrington archives. So during the same time that those Stanford scientists were brushing through seaweed in the darkness, looking for bolts unvisited since Hewitt had left them, Yamane pushed through the darkness of the library stacks in search for Ohlone knowledge rarely accessed since Meadows dictated it in the 1930s. Later, Yamane wrote about how she felt shy saying her ancestors' words out loud. She would practice them late at night, sitting awake in bed while her family slept. From basic words, she moved to songs. 
She began talking to basket makers from other Northern California tribes, and she became the first Ohlone to weave an Ohlone-style basket in 150 years. Interested in the canoes in which the tribe navigated their watery world, she joined a group to build one of the first Thule canoes to ply the San Francisco Bay since the 1800s. Since then, she built more than 30 new, she has built more than 30 new Thule canoes. Several times now, she has paddled the canoes into the tide pools in front of Monterey Bay Aquarium, just a few hundred feet away from that tide pool transect that I told you about. She became an expert in working with shells to create beads used as decoration on baskets and for jewelry. To do so, she needed to become an expert in where to find those shells, what species were present on what beaches, and how to treat them in the sunshine to create the material that would withstand jewelry making. I'm sharing this story, story about Linda Yamane with her permission. When researching the story, we met with Linda over dinner in Monterey. She arrived, of course, wearing her handmade shell jewelry, and she talked to us about the work it takes to find and revive a lost connection. She was the first of several people to tell us that it takes courage to keep watching in a changing world and tremendous foresight to record and document those observations. She sees herself as creating new beauty out of old knowledge. In the same years that Hewitt had spent recording one kind of message to the future, Meadows and several other Ohlone elders gifted future generations the information they would need to revive their culture. Yamane and Barry and his colleagues were observant enough to know that lessons from the past can help us shape and understand our future. That even sometimes we don't know why we are steadfastly mm -hmm. observing and taking notes, but that we hope that someday someone will pick up that archive like a message in a bottle and use it. The story I have told you informs the first chapter of a book that Eric Simmons and I published earlier this year, as I mentioned. We've worked on this book for several years with a shared goal of helping forge a stronger reconnection between people and the ocean. In writing the book, what Eric and I realized is that we can easily provide tangible evidence of how events on land, things like drought, wildfire, storms, unusually warm or wet winters, or unusually wet storms, for example, are devastating terrestrial environments and impacting people. But when we look out at the ocean, we often see a vast expanse of blue. Most people don't realize that those same scale of ecological and environmental events are happening in the ocean too. They are threatening ocean environments, and they're also threatening our long-standing human connection to the ocean. Now that I told you a story from the book, I wanted to just highlight a few other themes that we talk about in the book. So the first of those themes is what I've already mentioned, connection. I asked all of you to think about how we are connected to the ocean for a reason. And that is because engaging in dialogue with people who will work with us to reclaim that connection is essential. In fact, I noted that about a year ago, you had Dr. Catherine Hayhoe come speak to your group about how dialogue is a key step we can take towards addressing environmental challenges. The book interweaves stories of people who feel connected to the ocean all around the world and who are using that connection as a motivation to make a better future. The second theme that I'll highlight from the book is knowledge. We never come straight out and tell the reader this, but one of the implicit messages of the book is that we need to value different types of knowledge in protecting the ocean. So many people are very knowledgeable about the ocean. Scientists, community members, indigenous leaders, policymakers, and those who are making their living on the ocean, like fishermen and farmers of the sea, just to name a few. The book explicitly and implicitly weaves different perspectives and knowledges together because we need that to address today's challenges. And the final theme I will mention is action. 
The book tells you how others are taking action and how we hope that it inspires you to do the same. While news about the ocean can sometimes feel depressing, there are bright spots and success stories, and we've sprinkled those throughout the book and especially at the end so that the reader knows that there are people making a difference in the challenges that we face. In thinking about today's talk, I spent some time looking at pictures of the Irish coastline, which I really enjoyed because I haven't been there in about 20 years and I obviously need to visit again. One of the things that struck me about some of those images that I was looking at, including the one on the left from the southeastern coast of Ireland, is that it looks a lot like where I live and work on the California coast. So I'm using this as a way to bring up the universality of some of the challenges we face. While the book doesn't focus on issues facing Ireland specifically, there are several themes that apply no matter where you are in the world. So I'd like to take this opportunity just before taking questions that you have to point out four things that we discuss in the book that have direct regional relevance, I think, for all of you. These four things are marine, <clears throat> marine protected areas, global climate change, marine energy sources, protection and management of the deep sea. So I'll start with marine protected areas. As some of you may be very familiar, but in case you aren't, I'll review. Marine protected areas are areas that are protected and managed for the long term with a primary objective of conserving habitats, biodiversity, or species. They typically protect areas from some sort of human impact, whether it's fishing, mining, oil drilling, or other activities. Some of you may be familiar with this concept because they are integrated and tracked within the UN Sustainable Development Goals. Currently, around 7% of Ireland's maritime areas are protected, although those numbers depend on the source that you look at and their definition. There are global conservation goals of protecting 30% of land and sea by 2030. You may have heard of this, it's called the 30 by 30 initiative. But there are several challenges that we face in the development and um, protection of marine protected areas globally. And these challenges are discussed fairly extensively in the book. First of all, the monitoring and enforcement of protections is um, variable at best. And the levels of protection, what exactly they protect against can range significantly. So some have questioned, what is the meaning of 7% or 10% or 30%? if we can't clarify what is happening within these areas. And I think that's an issue that we face globally. On global climate change, there's so much I could say here, and I suspect many of you know quite a bit about this. So in this case, I'm specifically referring to anthropogenic or human caused climate change. The North Atlantic is warming faster than the global average in terms of ocean temperatures, and the Arctic region is warming even faster than that. This has implications for regional fisheries, weather, ocean circulation, and more. So just to call out one particular impact is impacts on ocean currents. The North Atlantic region is critically important for the movement of ocean currents, which redistribute heat and salt around the global ocean. This is an important place globally because of the nearby locations located near Greenland and Iceland, where colder waters sink and enter the deep ocean circulation system, sometimes called the conveyor belt, or in more scientific jargon, the Atlantic meridional overturning circulation. Disruption of these deep ocean currents due to climate change is likely to have big impacts on regional and global weather patterns and is an area of significant concern within the scientific community. And finally, again, there may be folks on the call who have greater expertise in this locally than I do, but um, sea level is of course a consequence of global climate change, sea level rise. There is an excellent report, um, Ireland's Climate Change Assessment published this year, 
and it documents both the local and global trends in sea level rise. I will note a specific message of this document that I quote here, which is the future is in our hands. I couldn't agree more with this message. It absolutely is in our hands and it depends on our decision-making about energy amongst other things. And speaking of energy, um, a stated uh, goal is to increase renewable energy sources by 2030. Specifically, Ireland's Climate Action Plan states a goal of 80% renewables by 2030. Wave and wind energy are key targets for expansion of renewable energy in this area. However, understanding environmental impacts and, and benefits are critical at this time. There are concerns about impacts on marine life, commercial fishing, and local communities. And I'll just note that this particular theme is analogous to processes currently underway in California, where we currently have test sites um, um, being developed for offshore wind to try to understand these impacts and benefits. And um, I'll end on a theme that's one of my favorite things to think about and talk about in the ocean, which is the amazing deep sea. So often when I talk with folks about deep sea environments, people will comment that they don't really know a lot about the deep sea or that the deep sea is not really connected to our sort of human experience on the planet because it is so far away and so deep. And it's, it turns out we are actually reliant upon the deep sea in many different ways. And I've just highlighted a few here, um, but this image shows um, part of the global network of cables that encircle the globe and are sitting on the deep sea floor. Um, these cables, there are around 600 of them that encircle the globe for telecommunications and internet purposes. And, um, and so we are reliant upon our knowledge of processes at, on the sea floor um, to hold up sort of this backbone of our global communication system. Additionally, as many of you I'm sure are aware, extraction of fossil fuels has over time expanded into deeper and deeper areas in the ocean. And there is currently intense interest and in drive towards extraction of mineral deposits from the deep sea, including lithium, cobalt, and graphite. These mineral deposits are critical for things like batteries, electric vehicles, and solar panels, all part of our shift to a lower carbon economy. So are driving a big interest in mining of the deep sea. Poland, France, Russia, and Norway all have exploration contracts to examine deep sea mining in the North Atlantic. And the International Seabed Authority is responsible for developing international regulations around these activities. We spend significant time in the book exploring the idea that we may be moving too fast into deep sea mineral extraction and not learning critical lessons from our past experiences in oil drilling and marine management. Along those lines, there is active research at the Irish Marine Institute to document deep sea biodiversity Important discoveries of deep sea coral reefs in the past 10 to 15 years give you a sense of what the deep sea can look like off the Irish coastline. Again, I've done work like this in California and we see very similar habitats in our area. I noted that on their website, the Irish Marine Institute states, and I quote, our key objective is to discover, protect and monitor Ireland's rich offshore marine biodiversity so that we can manage our marine resources effectively. Without a knowledge of what lives on our seabed, we are at risk of never fully understanding and appreciating Ireland's invaluable marine environment. I will end here with a picture of one of my favorite places on the California coast in Tomales Bay. And I hope to answer any questions that you have and perhaps you would still be willing to enter in the chat your ocean connection or share that with us in the Q&A period. Thank you so much.